Please come forward a little bit. Burn 
kindergarten, there was this one kid who came to school every single day with his hair sticking up, straight up, in 17 different places. He mixed plaids and checks and purples and browns, but he stood out. When a teacher runs across a kid with an air of individuality or leadership, they tend to set this kid apart from the rest as an instigator of trouble or rowdy. Well, I've always been that kid. In elementary school, the group of my friends and I used to always play a game called Steal the Bacon at Recess. One day, we were chased into the girls' bathroom by boys with cooties, and everyone, minus me, who was using the facilities, decided to play Steal the Bacon in the bathroom. They had, were having a great time until a teacher stormed in and threatened to take them all to the principal's office. And as she was herding them out the door, she turned over her shoulder and said, You too, Miss Massey! Me! I got yelled at. And to top it all off, I dropped the suspenders to my overalls in the toilet. But how ironic it was that I got in trouble and all I was doing was going to the bathroom. Now, when anything sneaky or devilish or underhanded is done, instantly all of my friends suspect me. One time a friend's car was toilet papered and whipped cream, and there were several people that could have done it. But it was I that woke up the next morning to see yellow and white streamers of toilet paper decorating my front yard. <laughs> Being an individual, it gives you fun and unique experiences, and they're yours, and they belong only to you. Seek within yourself, and you can reach a happy fulfillment when you realize that you are not afraid to be you. I may not be a uh, a superstar, or a quarterback, or a queen of Zambar. Maybe I slurp my soup, but I scuff my feet. And in backgammon, I'm always getting beat. Maybe my hair is long in a bright shade of blue. But baby, I tell you, <coughs> I'm nothing like you. Maybe I sing when I should talk. Maybe I skip when I should walk. I like my dessert before I eat. I don't like my crusts, and I don't salt my meat. I do crazy things, both new and bold, like jump out of planes or grow fuzzy green mold. I smile quite a lot, and I feel what I feel. And I do say my prayers before every meal. I like how life can be with my family and friends. Now let me tell you the key. Yesterday, I was. Today, I am. And tomorrow, I shall always be me. speakers two around. You're all in one round. The first thing you do is elect a presiding officer. Now this is done pretty simply. You volunteer if you think you can make a good PO and you vote. After of course a brief speech to get your qualifications out. Then once the presiding officer is elected that person is in charge of the Congress. And anything you want to do you do through the presiding officer. The next order of business after you pick your presiding officer is to get a bill. And you usually have anywhere between 5 to 50 to choose from. You choose one or two which you think are the most debatable, and you vote on it. You think which bills will make the best debate. If you get one of these, you have a couple of examples of both kinds of bills, or, well, bills and resolutions, which are what you debate. And you pick the bills you think are the most debatable, and these are also voted on. Once you've determined the bills, then you proceed into the speeches. The first speech is a speech by the author of the bill or someone that's been chosen to act as the author. This person reads the bill, explains it, tells you what the bill is for, what the bill will do, and speaks generally in favor of it. Then that person, after three minutes speaking on the bill, is cross-examined for one minute. And during that period, questions are taken from the floor, and the speaker answers them, which is pretty obvious. Then they go on to opponency speeches, and that's someone against the bill. And it's the same way. You're recognized by the PO, 
go up, you make a three-minute speech against the bill, followed by a one-minute cross-examination. Now, the Congress goes on like that until you reach the point where the bill is deadlocked and no one will speak on it anymore, everything's been said, and then you vote on it whether to pass the resolution or fail it. And if you pass it, then it's passed, you fail it, it's failed, and you go on to the next bill and the whole thing starts over. Uh, it's really pretty simple, but it sounds complex when you're explaining it, and it's pretty awesome your first time. But once you get into it, it's a good event, it's a lot of fun. I think I better open to questions now, I can run out of things to say. Do you have any questions to ask, Tim? There's somebody over there. Uh, I'll be, uh, how can you win it? Is there any? Okay, glad you brought that up because I forgot. The way you win is at the end of the House, the speakers nominate who they think are the best speakers in the House. Like if you thought some senator in a blue suit was good, you say, uh, I nominate the senator in the blue suit. And the judges will also make nominations to who they thought the best speakers were. And the House itself votes on this. It's different in state quals and state championships. Most tournaments, the students themselves vote on it and not judges. So it makes it a really good event because you're being judged by your peers. No, I, I just said it's run like the Senate. The average house is about 30 people. I've seen them as small as 15. I've seen them as large as close to 40. But you average is 20 to 30 people. Um, once again, that just depends on how long. Some Congresses last three hours and some last an hour and 15 minutes. Just depends. Is there any way to be careful? Uh, definitely. Just being generally aware of current events. We read newspapers, Time, Newsweek. Going to Congresses is really the best preparation. It, there's nothing like it, really. It's a lot of fun. Where does the Congress meet? Uh, it's just in a regular room, like you'd be at a, a tournament. Sometimes you have special rooms, like sorry. Sometimes you use a room similar to this because of the seating. It just all depends on the school. Question. a question we must ask. Who was Anthony Esposito? Son to Nicholas and Angela Esposito. Yes. Brother to Rudy Esposito. Yes. Cousin, nephew, grandchild. Tony Esposito died in the war. At his funeral, his father, Nick, mourns over his son's coffin, attempting to make restitution for his intense pride, which indirectly led to his son's death. The Burial of Esposito, written by Ronald Ridman, published by Chilton Book Company. What do you think about that, eh? He's sitting in the first row next to your mom and Rudy. Rudy don't even know him. He says to me, who's that? And I say, that's that bastard Uncle Carlo. Father Belushi says some very nice things about you. Nice man. Very educated. I have to pay $871. I only have seven hundred dollars left in the bank. Nobody's rich like your Uncle Carlo. Big shot, such a big shot. I don't speak to him anymore. Instead, I spit into his face. Your brother Rudy wants to go away to college. He's a good boy, like you. Both of my sons are good boys. So stubborn. Why do you be so stubborn with me? You think it's good to send you talk to his father that way? You stay home from the war. 
It's better that you stay home. They don't want you to fight the crazy people. The them fight. They're going to kill you, I tell you, they're going to kill I tell you what. It's nice seeing you stay. I not want you. You should go to school, Ruth. You should go to school. One son should stay home. Your mother should have one son at home. Who are you talking to, Nick? Myself. Nobody says you can't talk to yourself if you want to. Sure, Nick. You can talk to yourself if you want to. What are you doing here? I came to pay my respects to Tony. He was a good boy. I always liked him. You do that, now you go. How you feeling, Nick? You don't look too good. Your face is pale. Maybe you should take a vacation. Me, no take a vacation. You want to take a vacation, you go. Me, no take a vacation. How come, out of all the years you've been married to my sister, you never take on a vacation? I saved my mom. Is that what you do with it, Nick? Is that why you never take my sister anywhere? You never buy her anything? You don't tell me what to do with my money? And what is that, Nick? What do you do with your money? I mind my own business! What business is that, Nick? You don't have a business. You're what we call scraping by. A marginal man. And you know what that means, Nick? That means you live in a stinky, paint peeling, roach crawling, shit house in Coney Island. It means you never take my sister anywhere. You never buy her anything. You never gave your kids a chance to make something of themselves. You know what I'd do if I were you, Nick? I'd commit suicide. I'd take out an insurance policy and kill myself. This could have the auto, maybe. Just maybe because you don't have what it takes to be a man, I'm going to help you out. I don't take nothing from you. This funeral is going to cost an awful lot of money. Do you have the money to pay for it? I pay. What? You pay. It's going to cost $1,000. Do you have $1,000? They don't charge me that much. How much did they charge you? 800 did you add on to that the cost of renting the home services, the funeral cars, the flowers? Are you going to give the priest something for his church? Are you going to screw the church out of its money? I pay for everything. I'm glad you know that, Nick. I'm glad you know that you have the money to pay for everything. Because I was just talking to Angela, and she told me you don't have more than $700 in the bank. But it relieves me to know that the ground they're gonna shovel over my nephew is paid for. What do you want? You don't speak to me for 10 years, and now you want to pay? That's right, Nick. But why? Why do you want to pay? And Tony was a good boy. I always liked him. Angela's my sister, why wouldn't I want to pay? I'll give you $2,000, but why? Why do you give me the money? Because I've got the money, Nick. You hear that? I've got the money, you big shot. That's right, Nick. I'm the big shot. You live in a stinking shit house in Coney Island, and I live in an $85,000 home in Westchester. That's right, Nick. I'm the big shot. And whenever you need anything, you're going to come to me. I'd rather stop like a dog on the street before I come to you. No, Nick. You're not going to starve. You know why? Because you're going to come. I'm going to give, and you're going to take. Just like Rudy takes the money for me to go to school. Rudy don't take your money. The school to give Rudy the money. What? You think the $300 the school gave Rudy is going to pay for everything? That don't pay for nothing. It don't take your money. You go tell him that. You go tell him that he can't go to school. You go tell him that you're going to send him into the army, just like you sent Tony. What difference does it make if you wait another year? He's a young buddy working this shop. What difference does it make? What difference does it make? Someday, we're going to travel across the Pacific Ocean. Maybe, maybe.
Hello, Papa. How are you, Papa? I'm fine, Tony. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, Papa. They, they, they told me you were dead. Oh, I'm not dead, Papa. Look, I'm alive. I put myself in this coffin and they sent me home. I'm alive. I love you, Tony. I, I want to add everything for you. Don't cry, Papa. It's okay. I'll tell you what. Why don't you bring Mama and Uncle Carlo in here? And when they see I'm alive, they'll be so happy. Yeah. We're going to give them a very big joke. Hey, Tony? Yeah, Papa. A big joke. Uncle Carlo with all his money. I spit it in Uncle Carlo's money. I don't need him. I have two sons, two sons. Carlo, Angela, be ready, you doing? What's the matter, Nick? You wanted to tell me you made a mistake? Disgrazia, disgrazia. What are you doing, Nick? What do you think you're doing? I'm going to show you, big shot. I'm going to show you. Tony? Tony? He's not dead. The coffin's bolted shut. You can't open it. It's bolted shut. Not shut. Not dead. Tony! Tony! she said. The song wound and twisted from crescendo to crescendo and came to an end at last, leaving her shaking and white barely on her feet. They're not applauding! Why aren't they applauding? But they were standing, 
all of them clapping, cheering more wildly than any audience she'd ever had in her life. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You're so far away. Everybody's so far. I can't see you anymore. She wanted to take a step forward and move among them, getting a hug from one, a kiss from another. Oh, she wanted hugs and kisses so bad. And her hands, they were so cold, so cold. Won't somebody please come and take my hands? Somebody, please? But they were all fading. The stage, she looked around it. Where are all the guys? Hey, where's everybody going? And then she fell with agonizing slowness into the blackness and internal cold. The rose had gone home. To burn always with this hard, gem like flame, to maintain this ecstasy, is success in life. This quote is probably best illustrated in Emily Dickinson's poem, Success. Success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. To comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. Not one of all the purple hosts who took the flag today can tell the definition so clear of victory. As he defeated dying on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph break, agonized and clear. In The Turning Point by Arthur Lawrence, two women, Dee Dee and Emma, are faced with making a choice, choosing between the applause of an audience or marriage. Dee Dee chooses to end her career, never reaching her dream of success as a ballet dancer. Emma chooses to stay with the ballet. Years later, we find that both women, in one way or another, have misgivings about the decision. The choice was yours. It's much too late to regret it now, Dee Dee. And the same to you, Emma. I certainly don't regret mine. Then why are you trying to become a mother at your age? Dee Dee, I am sick to death of your jealousy and resentment. So am I. Then stop trying to blame your goddamn life on me. You picked it. You did. You took away the choice. You didn't give me the chance to find out if I was good enough. Well, I can tell you now, you weren't. You knew you weren't good enough. That's why you married Wayne. I loved him. So much that you said to hell with your career. Yes. Lie to yourself, not to me, Dee Dee. You married him because you knew you were second rate. You got pregnant because Wayne was a ballet dancer and that meant queer. You'll use anything for an excuse. I'll use what for an excuse? Trying to take away my child. I return the compliment. You're a liar. And you're a user. You have been your whole life, me. Michael pretending to love me, and now, and now Amelia. How Amelia? That display ten minutes ago, curtsy, embrace, applause. For you, not her. You were using her so everybody would say, Emma's so wonderful, Emma's so gracious. Untrue, but you are wonderful. You're amazing. It's incredible how you keep going on. You're over the hill and you know it and you're terrified. What are you going to fill in your scrapbooks and your toe shoes with, Emma? Not my daughter. Keep your hands off. Well, I'm a lot better for her than you ever were. Like her. Slamming Emma with her bag, they started to fight. Gasping, panting, they whacked and slammed and kicked, missing more often than not. They looked foolish. Ridiculous. Two middle-aged, overdressed vaudevillains who didn't know how to get off. They just looked funny now. Dee Dee started to giggle first. That set him off. And soon they were both laughing, trying to get their wind back. Oh, I, I must look awful. No. Beautiful. I don't know how you do it. You know, Jealousy, it's a point. 
poison. It makes one a monster. Well, it does make one unfair. Two. Two? Me too. Dee Dee, I don't remember what I said about having the baby. Honest. But I do know that I would have done anything to make sure I got that belly. You were too good, and I had to have it. I just had to. Oh, God. Oh, Emma, you don't know how long I've waited for you to say just that. How's about a drink? Inspector Ford burst into the study. On the floor was the body of Clifford Real, who apparently had been struck from behind with a croquet mallet. The position of the body indicated that the victim had been surprised in the act of singing Sorrento to his goldfish. <laughs> Evidence showed there had been a terrible struggle that had twice been interrupted by phone calls. One, a wrong number, and one asking the victim if he was interested in dance lessons. Before Rio had died, he dipped his finger into the inkwell and scrawled out a message. Fall sale prices drastically reduced. Everything must go. A businessman to the end, mused Ives, his manservant, whose elevator shoes, curiously enough, made him two inches shorter. <laughs> the terrace door was open, and footprints led from there, down the hall, and into a drawer. Where were you when it happened, Ives? Uh, in the kitchen, uh, doing the dishes. Ives produced some suds from his wallet to corroborate the story. <laughs> Did you hear anything? Uh, he was in there with some men. Uh, they were arguing over who was tallest. I thought I heard Mr. Wheel start yodeling, and then Mosley, his business partner, began yelling, My God, I'm going bald! <laughs> the next thing I knew, there was a harp glissando, and Mr. Wheel's head came rolling out onto the lawn. I heard Mosley threaten him. He said if Mr. Wheel touched his grapefruit again, he would not co-sign a bank loan for him. I think he killed him! Does the terrace door open from the inside or from the outside? Uh, from the inside? Why? Just as I suspected. I now realize it was you, not Mosley, who killed Clifford Wheel. How did Inspector Ford know? <laughs> because of the layout of the house, Ives could not have sneaked up behind his employer. He would have had to sneak up in front of him, at which time Mr. Wheel would have stopped singing Sorrento and used the mallet on Ives, a ritual they had gone through many times. Match wits with Inspector Ford. Five Spine-Tingling Mysteries by Woody Allen, published by Random. Kermit Kroll staggered into the living room of his parents' home, where they waited anxiously with Inspector Ford. <laughs> Thanks for paying the ransom, folks. <laughs> Never thought I'd get out of there alive. Tell me about it, stud. Well, I was on my way downtown to have my hat locked when a sedan pulled up and two men asked me if I wanted to see a horse that could recite the Gettysburg Address. I said, sure and got in. Next thing, I'm chloroformed and wake up somewhere tied to a chair and blindfolded. Inspector Ford examined the ransom note. Dear Mom and Dad, <laughs> leave $50,000 in a bag under the bridge on Decatur Street. If there is no bridge on Decatur Street, please build one. I am being treated well, given shelter and good food, although last night the clan's casino were overcooked. Please send the money quickly, because if they don't hear from you within several days, the man who now makes up my bed will strangle me. Yours, Kermit. P.S. 
This is no joke. I am enclosing a joke so you will be able to tell the difference. <laughs> Do you have any idea as to where you were being held? No, I just kept hearing an odd noise outside the window. Odd? Yeah. You know the sound a herring makes when you lie in it? And uh, how did you finally escape? Well, I told them I wanted to go to the football game, but I only had a single ticket. They said, okay, as long as you keep the blindfold on and promise to return by midnight. <laughs> well, I complied. But in the third quarter, the Bears had a big lead, so I left and made my way back here. Very, very interesting. I now know that this whole kidnapping is a put-up job. I believe you are in on it and are splitting the money. Inspector Ford? No! <laughs> Although Kermit Kroll did still live with his parents, his parents were 80 and he was 60. Actual kidnappers would never abduct a 60-year-old child as it makes no sense. The curious riddle! Apparently. Walker was suicide. Overdose of sleeping pills. Still, Something seemed amiss to Inspector Ford. Perhaps it was the position of the body inside the TV set, looking at <laughs> On the floor was a cryptic suicide note, which read, Dear Edna, my woolen suit itches me, so I've decided to take my own life. I leave you with my entire fortune, with the exception of my pork pie hat, which I hereby donate to the planetarium. Please do not feel sorry for me, as I enjoy being dead and much prefer to paying rent. Goodbye, Henry. P.S. This may not be the time to bring it up, but I have every reason to believe that your brother is dating a Cornish hen. <laughs> Edna Walker bit her lower lip nervously. What do you make of it, Inspector? Inspector Ford looked at the bottle of sleeping pills on the night table. <gasps> How long had your husband been an insomniac? For years. It was psychological. He was afraid that if he closed his eyes, the city would... Paint a white line down him. I see. Did he have any enemies? Not really. Except for some gypsies who ran a tea room on the outskirts of town. He insulted them once by putting on a pair of earmuffs and jumping up and down in place on their Sabbath. Inspector Ford noticed a half-finished glass of milk on the desk. It was still warm. <laughs> Mrs. Walker, is your son away at college? I'm afraid not. He was expelled last week for immoral conduct. It came as quite a surprise. They caught him trying to immerse a dwarf in tartar sauce. <laughs> and that's one thing they won't tolerate at an Ivy League school. And one thing I won't tolerate is murder. Your son is under arrest. Why did Inspector Ford suspect Walker's son had killed him? Mr. Walker was found with cash in his pockets. A man who was going to commit suicide would surely take a credit card and sign for everything. <laughs> The Stevelin gem. The glass case was shattered. And the Bellini sapphire missing. The only clues left behind at the museum were a blonde hair and a dozen fingerprints, all pinkies. The guard explained. <laughs> the guard explained that he had been standing there when a black-clad figure crept up behind him and hit him over the head with some notes for a speech. Before losing consciousness, he thought he heard a man's voice say, Jerry, call your mother! But he could not be sure. Apparently, the thief had come in through the skylight and walked down the wall with suction shoes like a human fly. The museum guards kept an enormous fly swatter for just such occasions. <laughs> but this time, they had been fooled. Why would anyone want the Bellini Sapphire? The museum curator asked. Don't they know it's cursed? What's this about their curse? The sapphire was originally owned by a sultan who died under mysterious circumstances when a hand reached out of a bowl of soup he was eating and strangled him. The next owner was an English lord who was found one day by his wife growing upside down in a window box. <laughs> Not much was heard of the stone for a while until it turned up in the possession of a Texas millionaire who was brushing his teeth when he suddenly caught fire. We purchased the sapphire only last month, but the curse seemed to be working still because shortly after we obtained it, the entire board of trustees at the museum formed a conga line and danced off a cliff. <laughs> well, it may have been a valuable jewel, 
but I want it back. And if you want it back, go to Handelman's Delicatessen. Handelman Delicatessen. And the rest, Leonard Handelman. You'll find that the sapphire is in his pocket. How did Inspector Ford know who the jewel thief was? The previous day, Leonard Handelman had remarked, Boy, if I had a large sapphire, I could get out of the delicatessen business. <laughs> The macabre incident. I just shot my husband. <laughs> Wept Cynthia Freem as she stood over the body of the burly man in the snow. <clears throat> How did it happen? We were hunting. Quincy loved to hunt, as did I. We got separated momentarily. The bushes were overgrown. I guess I thought he was a woodchuck. I blasted away. <laughs> You managed to plug him right between the eyebrows. Oh, no! It was lucky. I'm really quite an amateur at that sort of thing. I see. Inspector Ford examined the dead man's possessions. In his pocket, there was some string, an apple from 1904, and instructions on what to do if you wake up next to an Armenian. Mrs. Oh, Green! <laughs> was this your husband's first hunting accident? First fatal one, yes. <laughs> Did he always wear a toupee? Not really. He would usually carry it with him and then produce it if challenged in an argument. He sounds eccentric. He was. Is that why you killed him? Doodoo! How did Inspector Ford know it was no accident? <laughs> An experienced hunter like Quincy Freem would never have stalked deer in his underwear. Actually, Mrs. Freem had bludgeoned him to death at home while playing the spoons and tried to make it look like a hunting accident by dragging his body to the woods and leaving a copy of Field and Stream nearby. In her haste, she had forgotten to dress him. Why he had been playing the spoons in his underwear remains. Could you come forward, please? I will not resign, and you will not dismiss me. I will not allow you to exercise your warped compulsion to prosecute. I shall sue. I shall take you to the public courts. And I shall sue the Board of Trustees of the Marshall Blaine School if they support you. I am a teacher. I am a teacher. First, last, and always. Do you imagine for one instant that I will allow that to be taken from me without a fight? I have dedicated. And I will not stand by like some inky little slacker and let you rob me of it. And for what reason? For jealousy. Because I have the gift of claiming girls for my own, yes. And I am proud of it. I influence them to be aware of all the possibilities of life. Of beauty. Of honor. Of courage. The Prime of Miss Jean Brody by Muriel Spock. Published by Samuel French Incorporated. Yeah, well, your mother told me to come in. She says that you have not been feeling well, that you've been away from school all week. Not that missing classes is of any great concern. In my experience, the clever scholars are all too often retarded by dull and unimaginative teachers. <coughs> Sandy, I, I believe I am past my prime. I had reckoned on my prime lasting until I was at least 50. Are you listening, Sandy? Yes, Miss Brody. You, you will not believe this, but Miss McKay has stated flatly that, that it is one of my own set who has betrayed me. It is Monica, of course. <coughs> oh, I see you are not surprised. There is very little soul behind all of Monica's easy emotions. Monica is a loyal girl. She betrayed me. I renounced the man I love. I gave up Teddy Lloyd to consecrate my life to you girls. For you, Jenny, and Monica. Why did Monica do it? Miss Brody, you mustn't blame Monica. Jenny, there is at least Jenny. She and Mr. Lloyd will soon be lovers. She will encourage him. 
He will give up teaching to prepare an exhibition, and Jenny will know through me how to help him. I have that. Do you think that you are a providence, that you can, can ordain love? What? You haven't pulled it off. Jenny will not be Teddy Lloyd's lover. What are you saying, Sandy? Jenny will not be Teddy's lover, and I will not be your spy, your secret service. My spy? What on earth are you talking about? I have been dismissed from Marsha Blaine. Why are you sitting there talking about Providence and the secret service? What's the matter with you? Are you running a fever? No, not a fever. Then whatever are you saying? Teddy's lover. What? I am Teddy Lloyd's lover. Is that so difficult to believe? What does it matter to you which one of us it is? You are Teddy's lover? Yes. Whatever possessed you? He is a Roman Catholic. How could a girl with a mind of her own, a girl with insight, have to do with a man who can't think for himself? That doesn't seem to have bothered either one of us. We were, neither of us, very interested. Deal with you anymore. Yes, 
I expect that to be your gift, Sandy. To kill without concern. 